the understanding the IVF processes in surrogacy. And given that many of you are at various stages in your journey here, I wanted to start with an overview. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm a reproductive endocrinologist at a program called Oregon Reproductive Medicine, which is a fertility clinic on the west coast of the United States. I'm also a mom of three. Not this little blue guy in the front, but the half-naked one was my IVF baby that I had at 40. So although I didn't use a surrogate, I understand what some of the females today um, here today might be going through. A little bit about our program. Oregon Reproductive Medicine is an IVF clinic that was founded in 1989, and we um, have had over 25 years of working with various couples from over 40 countries, helping everyone to try and build their family. We're one of the larger uh, IVF clinics in the United States and are one of the busiest for surrogacy cycles in the United States as well. Um, part of what we're proud of in our facility is the fact that we have a state-of-the-art clean room embryology laboratory, which helps contribute to the success of our patients, and we've been able to offer consistently high live birth rates amongst the United States. We have our own in-house egg donor program and an in-house genetics team. So in thinking about IVF in the surrogacy process, first we're going to start about the basics of IVF. Um, so to think about IVF, we need to understand what happens in the course of spontaneous pregnancy. And simply put, in the course of a spontaneous pregnancy, a woman who's actively trying to get pregnant, or if you were utilizing an egg donor, that woman would simply ovulate one egg a month, which is horribly inefficient if you're trying to get pregnant. The goal of IVF is to get all of those eggs in a given month to grow, be able to remove them, fertilize such eggs with sperm in a lab to create embryos, which you can then transfer into the surrogate or into yourself if you were going that route. So how do we do that? Um, we have our patients or egg donors take injectable medications, which causes your ovary to look quite enlarged, but it's not too uncomfortable, and you're on these for about eight to 12 days, so the donor will be on them for that period of time. And then there's a simple, straightforward surgical procedure to remove the eggs, which allows those eggs to then be fertilized in the embryology lab with either your sperm, your partner's sperm, or donor sperm. And the embryos are then grown out. And in our program, like most programs in the US, the embryos are developed until day five, which is called the blastocyst stage. And for us, this is an important process because we know about half of all embryos might stop growing in this process. So by waiting until day five, it gives us a better chance of selecting the best embryo to help result in a successful pregnancy. On day five, you would then have the choice to either undergo a fresh embryo transfer if the uterus was ready to receive the pregnancy or elect to do extra chromosome testing on the embryos to allow us to even further select an embryo which might give you the best chance of getting pregnant. Such embryos are then frozen while we're waiting for the results. So when we think about IVF in the context of surrogacy, it's important to recognize that while there's over 140,000 embryo transfers done per year in the United States, 4,000 4, of those are done into surrogates. So that represents 3% of all IVF cycles. When we break that down further, about half of those, so 2,000 transfers, are with a patient's own egg into a surrogate. We call that group A. And the other half, about 2,000, would either be um, single sperm provider or what we consider group C when there's two men providing sperm with an egg donor to go into a surrogate. So even though in the United States there's many, 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 many clinics who do IVF and many, many, many of those clinics do surrogacy, there's actually a limited number of clinics who do the majority of those cases. And I think Sam has done a really good job today of inviting not only my clinic, but Dr. Ringler from California Fertility Partners and Dr. Donishman from San Diego Fertility, who are some of the top clinics in the country in terms of our volume of surrogacy. And with that experience, we can all offer you the best chances of succeeding. So when we think about IVF in terms of where the surrogacy would fit in, if you're doing a fresh embryo transfer, um, you would go through that process and then the uterus would be stimulated at the same time to place the embryo back. If you're doing a frozen embryo transfer, then you would choose your egg donor or if you're using your own eggs, undergo the IVF treatment, embryos would be created as I described, and then those embryos would undergo extra testing to better select that embryo which could make a baby, and that would require freezing the embryos. Once you've undergone this extra testing, you can then prepare the uterus at a later time to transfer a better selected embryo to result in a successful outcome. When you're thinking about the choices you would make when you're doing a surrogacy cycle, it includes carrier screening and then, as I'll mention in a little bit, this extra testing on the embryos to, again, give us a better chance of selecting the right embryo for transfer. And so when you're doing that with this, um, let me see, I'll go back one. With the surrogate, again, we like to break down the cycle into two different parts. The first part is 
either you going through IVF or the donor going through IVF to create the embryos, testing the embryos, and then while you're waiting to be matched with the surrogate, get your test results back, and then once the surrogate is ready, you already have embryos created to move forward in that process. Sam had mentioned in his um, previous talk that this can take over two years, and sometimes we find in the United States that if you do it in a stepwise fashion, the whole process can take more like 18 months. So again, with fresh embryo transfer, you would either talk to your surrogacy agency, talk to your clinic, get matched with a surrogate. Once a surrogate was matched, then you start your IVF process, create your embryos while the surrogate was undergoing her test, uh, preparing her uterus, and then transfer the embryo. And then 40 weeks or nine months later, the surrogate would have the baby. If you're doing a frozen embryo transfer, this would allow you to actually start your journey and create your embryos while waiting to be matched, so that once your embryos are created, um, hopefully you've gone through the six-month process of waiting to be matched, and then the surrogate can start their cycle and then have the pregnancy. As the IVF physician, we're really involved in the first part of that journey, so preparing either you or the egg donor to undergo the IVF process, and then screening the surrogate. And then the surrogate's OBGYN would take over in the United States at around eight to, nine, eight to 10 weeks of pregnancy, and they would manage the surrogate throughout the rest of her pregnancy and then through the delivery. So I've mentioned multiple times about trying to select the best embryo because we really want to optimize your success rates. By optimizing your success rates, it's going to minimize the time you're going through this, the heartache that you might suffer, and the cost involved. So when we think about selecting embryos, there's traditional selection, which is morphologic grading, and then chromosomal screening of embryos, which is a, a newer technology to that we believe can help us improve embryo selection. Traditionally, we would look at an embryo and say, oh my gosh, this embryo is beautiful or these embryos are beautiful. But not every beautiful embryo can result in a healthy baby. And when we look at beautiful embryos, we've discovered that over time, anywhere between uh, up to 44% of them may be chromosomally abnormal. That's what that term aneuploidy means. And especially if in um, couples where the female partner is older and thinking about utilizing her own eggs as we get older, and I hate to look at where I am on this graph, the number of eggs we have that are chromosomally normal gets higher and higher and then it becomes harder to conceive a pregnancy. And if you're thinking about transferring these embryos into a surrogate, it becomes particularly challenging to find the right embryo. And if you're putting embryos back that are chromosomally abnormal, then the surrogate might go through extra transfers, suffer more miscarriages, um, extend the length of your journey, increase costs. So we really want to minimize all of that for you. So we offer a process called chromosome screening, um, or CCS. It's also known as pre-implantation genetic screening, called PGS. And this would allow us to use those embryos on day five and biopsy or remove a couple cells that can then undergo testing through a program called next generation sequencing, which means it's a way to look at the DNA to determine if there's 46 chromosomes in that embryo. When we do that, we would then freeze the embryos and wait and get the test results. And then we would select from those embryos that are chromosomally normal. And this, as I've mentioned before, can potentially increase your implantation rate, minimize the number of transfers, and decrease the miscarriage rate to help your surrogate conceive ideally on the first try. Um, since we've been utilizing this technology in our clinic over the past few years, we've noticed an improvement in pregnancy rates. And interestingly, regardless of the age of the woman providing the egg, whether it's an egg donor or someone older, the pregnancy rates are consistently high if we can find a chromosomally normal embryo. You're going to hear a lot about success rates and other things today. And as Sam had mentioned, it's a good, it'd be important to really verify those results. And so um, within the United States, there's a number of different websites that you can look up to look at success rates to verify the results I'm telling you today and what you'll hear from other people including SART, the Society for Assisted Reproductive Technology, which is a, a reporting body which U.S. clinics would report their information. Thank you very much. <laughs>